that this wasn't true. It must have set up some sort of strain. Yes, I think so. I, as I look back over those early days, uh, I did have something of an inattention. On the one hand, my mother uh, taught me that I should feel a sense of somebodiness. On the other hand, uh, I had to go out and face a system uh, which uh, stared me in the face every day saying, you are less than, you are not equal to. So this was a real tension within. Now, out of your own personal experience, the only example you've given me so far is one family where the mother didn't too much care to have you play with her children. What were you really prevented from doing as a child that a white child might have done? Well, in my uh, days in Atlanta as a child, there was a pretty strict system of segregation. Uh, for instance, I could not use uh, the swimming pool so that uh, for a long, long time I could not go and swim in swimming until uh, the YMCA was built, a Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. Uh, I could not uh, go to the so-called white schools. There were separate schools. And I attended a high school in Atlanta, which was the only high school for Negroes in the city. Uh, and this was a real problem because in Atlanta there are more than 200,000 Negroes. In many of the stores downtown, to take another ex example, uh, I could not go to a lunch counter uh, to buy a hamburger, a cup of coffee, or something like that. Uh, I could not attend any of the theaters. Only uh, there were one or two Negro theaters. Uh, they were very small, but uh, they did not get the main pictures. If they got them, they were two years late or three years late. So that uh, by and large, there was a very strict system of segregation, and uh, there was nothing called racial integration at that time in Atlanta. Now, that's a description of the system. Was anybody actually cruel to you or violent to you because you were colored? Yes, uh, we did confront some of those problems. Uh, I remember as a child seeing uh, problems of police brutality. And uh, this was mainly aimed at Negro children and uh, Negro adults. Uh, I can remember also uh, the organization that is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this is an organization that stands on white supremacy and uh, an organization that in those days even uh, used violent methods uh, to preserve segregation and to keep the Negro in his place, so to speak. Now, I can remember seeing the Klan actually beat uh, Negroes on some of the streets uh, in Atlanta. But nobody ever beat you personally? No, I never. I did have one experience, uh, which was a relatively minor experience, but it still uh, lived with me a good deal. When I was uh, about eight years old, I was in one of the downtown stores of Atlanta, and uh, all of a sudden, someone slapped me, and the only thing I heard was somebody saying, uh, you are that nigger that stepped on my foot. And uh, it turned out to be a white lady. And, uh, of course, I didn't retaliate at any point. I finally went and told my mother what had happened, and she was very upset about it. But uh, at that time, uh, the lady who slapped me had gone, and uh, uh, my mother and I left the store almost immediately. Can you remember at this distance of time uh, why you didn't uh, respond in any violent way? Was it that you'd already thought of nonviolence, or was it that you just didn't dare as a Negro to, to take any strong action against a white? Well, I think probably it was a combination of two things. I hadn't thought of nonviolence at that early age as a, as a system of thought, uh, as a practical technique. Uh, I think uh, a great part of it was that uh, uh, I just uh, didn't think I wouldn't dare uh, retaliate uh, or hit back when a white person was involved. And uh, I think some of it was a part of my uh, native structure, so to speak, and that is that uh, I have never been one to hit back too much. Well, now, that's all, what, 20 years or so ago, I suppose. Yes. But how... 
bad is the complaint today? After all, the United States has changed a lot. Uh, the Negro's rights are protected under the law. What exactly, how much has this system changed between then and now? Well, it has changed a good deal. Uh, it is far from what it ought to be, but uh, I can see many, many changes that have taken place over the last few years. For instance, in the same Atlanta, Georgia, which is uh, one of the largest cities in the South, uh, there are some Negro students in formerly all-white schools. Some of the parks uh, are integrated, some of the public parks. Just a few weeks ago, uh, about 177 lunch counters uh, were open to Negroes on a thoroughly integrated basis. Uh, I think uh, I could say also that court injustice is uh, not as glaring a reality today as it was uh, 10 years ago. Police brutality has uh, diminished a great deal. So that uh, in Atlanta alone there are many changes, and uh, when I look over the total situation, I can say the same thing. Uh, for instance, when the United States Supreme Court uh, rendered uh, the decision uh, declaring segregated schools unconstitutional in 1954, uh, 17 states and the District of Columbia practiced segregation in the public schools. Uh, but today, all, uh, I would say most of these states have made some move toward integration. Only three states are holding out, namely the states of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Yes. So that uh, there has been a great change uh, since say, 1950 or 1945. Now, I can't help following you up at one point there. You said, I think I'm quoting you more or less verbally correctly, you said that denial of justice was less glaring than it used to be and that police brutality had, I think your words were, somewhat diminished. Now, it follows from that that you're not content that the Negro gets justice in the United States as things are at present and you're not certain that the police do not victimize him. Well, yes, uh, uh, I think uh, we have moved on a great deal, but we still face token integration. By token integration, I mean a few Negroes getting uh, justice in a particular situation, but the vast majority still confronting problems of uh, economic insecurity, uh, and social isolation, so that while we have moved on, uh, we only have token integration. And the problem now is to move from from token integration to uh, overall integration, where it uh, involves more than just a few students in a school, more than just a few lunch counters open, uh, more than uh, gaining justice in the courts in a few situations, but in every situation. You spoke a moment ago about having been thrust forward into this position of leadership. How exactly did it happen? Why are you at 32 virtually the leader of the Negroes in the United States? Well, I started out as a pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, which uh, uh, is a state that adjoins the state of Georgia. Uh, after I finished my graduate work in Boston, I returned to Montgomery to pastor a church. After I had been in Montgomery about a year, uh, we had the problem there of uh, facing many indignities and injustices on the city buses. Uh, Negroes were treated in a very discourteous manner. The bus drivers usually talked to Negro passengers in a very inhuman way. Uh, not only that, uh, if one had visited Montgomery, Alabama prior to 1955, December of 1955, uh, he would have seen Negro passengers actually standing over empty seats. Uh, this was because uh, the first... We are we are coming to the end of uh, today's uh, broadcast, and we are airing right now a portion of a broadcast. It's a three-part series uh, entitled uh, 
the word of God, equity for all, and it goes into equity as compared to here on earth, as compared to the equity which God is talking about. We want to run that later on in a uh, three-part series uh, at a later broadcast. But we want to thank all of us that joined us this morning, and good morning, Alabama. Uh, I love Beatrice, Alabama, which is where I'm from. And the question was asked, what are you doing today? We took a a number of uh, um, headlines from uh, the Yellow Hammer newspaper. We want to thank them for those powerful um, headlines that ran yesterday and some of the couple of days past. You can find Yellow Hammer news and follow it. You'll find a lot about about Alabama. Um, you'll find out who's leading Alabama, what's in control of Alabama. And for one thing, you'll find out how Alabama is voting and the reason why Alabama is voting. I find it really unique that Doug Jones, as a youngster, fought the Ku Klux Klan just like the Republicans did uh, years ago, and he that's where he got his notoriety as a, a lawyer here in Alabama when he was picked as a uh, lawyer to handle situations such as that. And he went on to become a, a, a very good lawyer and uh, now sits in the Senate. He replaced uh, somebody uh, in the Senate that had long been a Republican for years. He was the first Democrat to be elected. But he really speaks from a position, a central position, trying to work with people and um, give and take on situations. And that's how you do politics. It's a give and take. So you ain't no my way or no way. That's what's happening now. That's what's the uh, common thread in politics now. Are you hating you? Who are you running against that they all evil and they are this, they and that? You're just as bad as them. I don't care whether you're Republican, Independent, Green Party, uh, President Trump, uh, whoever you are, uh, uh, in the past, politician, president, they all did different stuff in different ways. But one thing you really need to know, and that is this, you got to work together with people. you got to work with people. You can't just have your way all the time. That's why you have give and take. That's why you call it politics. It's a dirty game in the sense that where you want to um, uh, treat people wrong and construct laws to prohibit people from doing their normal and natural things they should do. So don't get caught up in that. Uh, we hope that you uh, stay with us, and uh, this is the end of our broadcast for today. But we're going to uh, see you all next time on uh, House of Production Gospel Blog Talk Radio. You take care, and um, make sure that you do some praying, praying for this president, praying for the leaders, praying for all that are running for public office, because they, believe you me, they need it. They really need it. On behalf of all of this House of Production Gospel Blog Talk Radio, I will take care now, and we'll see you next time on House Even Gospel Law Talk Radio. You listen to House E Production Gospel Blog Talk Radio, www.blogtalkradio.com. House E Production Gospel. We are your internet radio. You listen to House E Production Gospel Blog Talk Radio from the Internet City, Beatrice, Alabama. Enjoy. You're listening to How C Production Gospel Blog Talk Radio from the Internet City, Beatrice, Alabama. Enjoy. www.notoriousdesigns.com for award-winning graphics and web designer. Check out www.